Hi there, I'm Karen Marie and this is Sunday, September 13th, 2020 and this is Psyched Up. So today I've been guided to talk about a dark subject. Um, September is National Suicide Prevention Month. I have my t-shirt on. I wear the teal and purple for someone that I miss every single day. And for me, that's my father. My father committed suicide when I was 15 years old in 1978. His mother had also committed suicide postpartum when he was an infant. So this is a subject that I know well, personally. I have also suffered from depression. And in the second semester of my junior year in college, found myself um, checked into a mental hospital for depression. I spent seven weeks there and was over-medicated for a long time. Um, and when I got out of the hospitals, when I made my first intuitive decision of trusting my own intuition over what someone else in authority w was telling me what the truth was, which they told me I would always have to be on antidepressants in order not to be depressed. So in my heart, in my gut, I felt like that was BS and I tossed my meds down the toilet. Um, I was over medicated, 350 milligrams a day of a antidepressant and 1800 milligrams a day of Motrin is what they put me on. Like that would have kicked my liver's butt in no time flat. But, and I don't re recommend that for everyone. There's people out there who really need medication and I don't want to disparage anyone who feels that they need it because you've got to trust your own inner voice in these things. But for me, I didn't feel like that was the truth. I felt like there were other tools that I could find to work to access my brain chemistry and to make myself feel better. So when my father died, it woke me up. I felt like I was sleepwalking in my life up to that point. And at that point in time, I started asking, why am I here? What's my life about? Um, you know, I think I ended up in the hospital and super depressed. PTSD, they weren't talking about PTSD back in the 80s when I was hospitalized. Um, but I believe that that's what was really going on. I was suffering from the fallout of my father's suicide. And although I'd suffered from depression, I didn't want to kill myself. I think that's because I was a victim of suicide myself, that I knew what the aftermath left behind for those that he loved. And I didn't ever want to do that to anyone that I loved. I, when I, my form of depression, I just crawled into bed and didn't want to get out, basically. I just didn't want to do life at all, was afraid to do life. and. What I later learned as I drilled down and started looking what was inside of me is that I had some really, really harsh negative self-talk going on. I didn't feel good about myself and I didn't generate good thoughts about myself. So I was steeped in this negativity and um, pessimism and doubt about myself and disbelief in anything positive, really. I just, and I didn't realize I was saturated in that. But right after I got out of the hospital, I was introduced to Buddhism, Nichiren Buddhism. I was invited to come to a Buddhist meeting. And at that point, all bets were off. I, sure, I'll go to a Buddhist meeting. Why not? And they handed me a card with the mantra that they were chanting on it, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And I began to join this group of people chanting. And in the space of 10 minutes of chanting, I tapped into joy. Like I had just been hospitalized for two months for depression. And before that, I don't even think I ever felt this kind of joy that I'd felt just from 10 minutes of chanting. So I wanted to know more. It began my seeking deeper. And from that point forward, I have practiced Buddhism. Uh, that's 36 years now that I've been practicing Buddhism because it's a tool that I found that works for me. It has never failed to help me tap in to my Buddha nature. It's like, I feel like everyone has this fundamental darkness within and everyone has a Buddha nature. That's what I'm gonna call it. You can call it your Christ self or your higher self. But the fundamental darkness that's within our lives is also the negativity, the negative things that we tell ourselves. In most cases, people who are suicidal are super harsh on themselves. Their inner self-talk is on the floor. Not good. At the time when I was hospitalized, my self-esteem was 
on the floor. I didn't feel good about myself. I wasn't telling myself anything positive. I wasn't aware of that. I wasn't even conscious of what was going on inside. But my spiritual practice over time made me more and more conscious about my inner self-talk and what I was telling myself and what I was believing to be true. We create our reality by what we think, what we feel, what we say, what we do. These are all the causation factors that create our life. And it is impossible to have a happy, joyful life if you are steeped in negativity and anger and resentment and the negative fundamental darkness within yourself. So um, we're in difficult times. I don't need to tell anybody that. Astrologically, it's super intensive. I've been talking about the transits. I'm not going to go into a lot of that today, but I will say that Mars is retrograde, so it's really stirring up anyone with unresolved anger issues. And anger turned outward is aggression, right? Anger turned inward is depression. Anger turned sideways is humor. That's one thing I learned a long time ago. I think it's valid. Um, so we need to pick up tools in order to get ourselves out of a negative space if we're in one. Um, one of the things that I have found was my spiritual practice, but that's not the only thing. Over time, I put together that I needed B vitamins and flaxseed oil for my brain chemistry. I also needed to stay off of flour and sugar and alcohol because those were poisons to my brain. Um, what we put in our body feeds our soul as well. And if we're putting crap in, we're going to feel like crap. So one of the things that you can do if you're feeling crappy is to eliminate sugar. It's one of the quickest ways to feel better in your brain, feel better in your emotional body, moving your body regularly. It's one of the things that I have, it's one of my things that I try to do on a regular basis. If I go too many days without moving my body and getting my heart rate up, I'll start feeling kind of funky. So like moving our body, the endorphins that we release is so critical. Um, I feel like also taking our attention off of ourselves and putting it onto others is another thing that I will do over and over and over again to pull myself out of, of a depression. To help someone else who's struggling can help you feel better to get out of yourself when you're stuck in that place. Now, sometimes when you're in a depressed state, I know that the phone weighs 20 tons. It's hard to even pick it up and tell someone you need help. But it's so imperative that you get some form of help. You reach out, you pick up tools for helping, right? If you can't help yourself, ask for help from someone else. So I wanted to just um, talk about the suicide hotline. 24-7, there's a free phone call that you can make and talk to a professional at any time of day or night, all right? So it's 1-800-273-TALK or 8255. So that's 1-800-273-8255. That's the number for the National Depression Suicide Prevention Hotline. So pick up the phone and call someone, let them know. There are tools to get out of your depression. Spiritual tools, I feel like, are the most important ones. I was talking about the planets, Mars being retrograde, stirring up people's stuff, and the outer planets aren't moving right now. So we can feel stuck and we can't do anything else, right? So what do you do when everything outside is imploding and you can't move forward and your life may have fallen apart? It's an opportunity for an inside out job. It's an opportunity to go within, to pick up spiritual practice, to access that divine within us, right? We all have fundamental darkness within us. We all have the divine within us. I call that my Buddha nature. You can call that your Christ self, your higher self, your inner voice. For, my, for me, my intuition, I believe all, everyone's intuition is the voice of that higher self to be able to follow the inner voice. And the inner voice is a loving, kind voice. If it's a harsh, you need to do this, you should do that, that is not your inner voice. That is your mind 
talking, right? Our mind can be full of all kinds of negativity, all kinds of negative feelings, beliefs that about ourselves, right? So to change how we feel, to change your mind, to even be able to withdraw and observe your mind and just sit there and watch it is a step in the right direction. There's all kinds of Buddhist principles and practices. There's like as many different Buddhist traditions as there are stars in the sky almost. They all have different practices. And there's not just Buddhism. Lots of different tools can help you access that divine nature. But today I wanted to read from one of my favorite teachers, which is Pima Chundran. Um, she actually is a Buddhist nun, but not in my tradition of Buddhism. But she, her book, um, When Things Fall Apart, is something that was huge for me back in the day when I first encountered it. So I wanted to read a little bit from the wisdom of Pima Children. Um, and she's talking about what makes a matri, which is her, uh, her spiritual practice, right? What makes matri such a different approach is that we are not trying to solve a problem. We are not striving to make pain go away or to become a better person. In fact, we are giving up control altogether and letting concepts and ideals fall apart. She says she gets letters from people that say they're the worst person in the world. Sometimes this worst person is getting older and feels he has wasted his life. Sometimes she's a suicidal teenager reaching out for help. The people who give themselves such a hard time come in all ages, shapes, and colors. The thing that they have in common is that they have no loving kindness for themselves. I feel like that's super key. The most difficult times for many of us are the ones we give ourselves. True story. It's never too late for any of us to look at our minds, to look at what we're generating within. The painful thing is that when we buy into disapproval, we're practicing disapproval. When we buy into harshness, we're practicing harshness. The more we do it, the stronger these qualities become. How sad it is that we become so expert at causing harm to ourselves and others. The trick then is to practice gentleness and letting go. We can learn to meet whatever arises with curiosity and not make it such a big deal. Instead of struggling against the force of confusion, we could meet it and relax. When we do that, we gradually discover that clarity is always there. In the middle of the worst scenario or of the worst person in the world, in the midst of all the heavy dialogue within ourselves and without, open space is always there. Our per I'm jumping through here. Our personal demons come in many guises. We experience them as shame, as jealousy, as abandonment, as rage, I feel like also addiction. They are anything that makes us so uncomfortable that we continually run away. We do the big escape. We act out, say something, slam a door, hit someone, or throw a pot as a way of not facing what's happening in our own hearts. Or we shove the feelings under and somehow deaden the pain. That's where the addictions come in. We can spend our whole lives escaping from the monsters of our minds. All over the world, people are so caught and running that they forget to take advantage of the beauty around them. We become so accustomed to speeding ahead that we rob ourselves of joy. Being able to appreciate, being able to look closely, being able to open our minds, this is the core of Matri. When the rivers and air are polluted, when families and nations are at war, when homeless wanderers fill the highways, these are traditional signs of a dark age. Another is that people become poisoned by self-doubt and become cowards. Practicing loving kindness towards ourselves seems as good as a way to start illuminating the darkness of difficult times. Good as a way as any to start illuminating the darkness of difficult times. Being preoccupied with our self-image is like being deaf and blind. It's like standing in the middle of a vast field of wildflowers with a black hood over our heads. 
It's like coming upon a tree of singing birds while wearing earplugs. There's so much resentment and so much resistance to life. In all nations, it's like a plague that's gotten out of control and it's poisoning the atmosphere of the world. At this point, it might be wise to wonder about these things and begin to get the knack of loving kindness. I'm going to jump forward to another chapter here. Um, or I'm jump, actually, I'm going to jump back. Um, so we're so um, drawn to externals, you know, how we look, what our jobs are, the money we have in the bank, our things, our stuff. Of course, we can't take any of that with us and none of these things. Over time, you might get, oh, the excitement of the new house or the new car, or the best job. But over time, that fades away and then we're left with what we are what's generated on the inside because that is the true source of happiness in our life it's also the true source of our misery and despair so um when we nailed with when we are nailed with the truth we suffer we look in the bathroom mirror and there we are with our pimples our aging face our lack of kindness our aggression and timidity all that stuff this is where tenderness comes in when things are shaky and nothing is working, we might realize that we are on the verge of something. To me, this is the key. We might realize that this is very vulnerable and tender place and that tenderness can either can go either way. We can shut down and feel resentful or we can touch in on that throbbing quality. It's a kind of testing, a kind of testing that spiritual warriors need in order to awaken their hearts. Sometimes it's because of illness or death that we find ourselves in this place. We experience a sense of loss, loss of our loved ones, loss of our youth, loss of our life, loss of a job. <laughs> Things falling apart is a kind of testing and also a kind of healing. We think that the point is to pass this test or to overcome the problem, but the truth is that things don't really get solved. They come together and they fall apart. Then they come together again, and they fall apart again. It's just like that. The healing comes from letting there be room for all of this to happen. Room for grief, for relief, for misery, for joy. When we think that something is going to bring us pleasure, we don't know what's really going to happen. When we think something is going to give us misery, we don't know. Let there be room for not knowing is the most important thing of all. We try to do what we think is going to help, but we don't know. We never know if we're going to fall flat or sit up tall. When there's a big disappointment, we don't know if that's the end. It may be just the beginning of a great adventure. So in the form of Buddhism I practice, we talk about poison to medicine or obstacles to benefit. That if you're looking at a negative situation in your life, for example, depression that you can't seem to crawl out of, you can look at that as poison. And poison can be changed to medicine. You can be looking at it as an obstacle. An obstacle can be turned into a benefit. That's what I do with my practice when I'm faced with something and I don't know how to shift it. I don't know what the answer is. I don't know where to go to find direction. I can't shut my mind down long enough to feel any kind of inner peace, then I chant to turn poison to medicine. I chant to turn an obstacle into a benefit. And every single time, 100% of the time, that prayer has worked for me. Now, sometimes it's really quick. I get an insight right away. Sometimes I have to keep at that prayer until I have that aha moment, the realization that brings me what I need. The truth is though, whatever you're experiencing will never last. If you're in the space of the deepest, darkest despair you've ever been in, it's not gonna last forever. You won't feel like that forever. If you're in the greatest, highest joy you've ever experienced, that too does not last. There's this ebb and flow in the nature of life. It's really about being able to access that part of ourself that's eternal. When we put these bodies down, our soul continues on. It doesn't get us off the karmic wheel to end our lives. To me as a Buddhist, death 
is a nap between lifetimes and we just pick up and we start again. We're working through the evolution of our soul in these bodies. The lessons that we came here to learn are so much deeper than just finding the right person, finding your soulmate and living happily ever after. Happily ever after is really about living happily in the now. How can you access happiness right now? It's not in your negative mind, that's for sure. And so one of the things that is powerful is to work with affirmations, to work with statements that help reprogram the way that you're thinking. If you're saying, for example, you're trying to manifest a love relationship in your life, but you're saying, yeah, I'm always alone. I never get the person I want to be with. I always get jacked around by people. If those are the things that you're generating, what are you going to experience in your life? You're going to experience people that jack you around, people that aren't there for you. If you learn how to love yourself, if you can start with baby steps, a deep breath in and a deep breath out, letting go of the negative thoughts that you have in your head, breathing them out, breathing in just divine peace, breathing out those. That's the basic, the most basic meditation you can do is a simple intake in of your breath and breathing out everything that's funky, right? Breathing in divine healing, divine light, peace, those things that you need, breathing out despair, misery, angst, right? If you need help with an addiction, 12-step programs are a free way to get support for your addiction, no matter what your addiction is, whether your addiction is to food or to drugs or alcohol or behaviors. Codependency is one of the gnarliest addictions that you can get in. If you really feel like controlling someone else is going to make you happier. If you, if someone will just love me, if I can just get that person to listen to me, if you're trying to control someone else outside of yourself, it's a setup for misery, right? We can't control things beyond ourselves. We can't control whether there's fires in California right now or whether it's sunny or raining. We can be, we can find this place though within the midst of any struggle to turn the light on within, right? That's where spiritual practices come in. Right now when we can't affect a change externally, we can begin to affect a change in our lives. I could have never become the psychic if I wasn't on a spiritual path first. I approach my work from a spiritual place. Yes, I was always psychic. I was very empathic, but I didn't become a channel and be able to channel a higher realm coming through me until I learned how to plug into spiritual practices that help me get out of my fundamental darkness, help me get out of my lower self. And they're called spiritual practices for a reason. We don't just do a meditation and all of a sudden we're one forever. We don't just chant a mantra that's powerful and become a Buddha right then and there. It's a practice of shifting and changing the negative causes we've set in our life and transforming them to positive ones. Now I say that I have a predisposition for depression but I don't experience depression anymore. As long as I'm doing my tool bag, I don't, and I don't feel depression. And for me, that's moving my body and doing my chanting every day, doing my bath, breath work and other forms of meditation, eating healthy, moving my body, reaching out to friends, picking up the phone and, and calling, getting out of yourself, getting out of myself. If I am stuck, in a funky place within, I pick up the phone and call someone that's going to make me laugh. I purposely go looking for humor and things that bring me joy um, to purposely bring joy into my life because it's there if you look for it. But if you're stuck in a dark, pessimistic outlook on life, if your response to everything is negative and critical, you're going to feel horrible. You're not going to shift that until you can begin to start working with the inner workings of your mind. The first step is just at least turn off the negativity. If you can't generate positive thoughts, try to catch 
your mind in the neg negative ones and just go, oop, nope, that's not the truth I want to create for myself, right? So that's what I feel guided to talk about today. I hope this is reaching someone that needs to hear this. If you have someone in your life that you feel is suicidal, trust your own intuition about that too, because I have literally saved people's lives because I listen to my intuition that lets me know they're suicidal. They really plan on killing themselves. I have literally picked up the phone and called someone psychiatrist. I have literally driven them to mental health hospitals. I've done that three different times to save someone else's life because I feel like they're on the brink and I need to reach out to them. So pay attention to those little subtle things that maybe your intuition telling you, hey, call Fred, call Susie, right? Go see them, go show up at their door, go check at them, see if they're okay. Right now, there's so many people that are isolating in their own homes and they're stuck in their stuff and they can't reach out to people. Try to make a call to one of these people. Try to reach out to these people and trust your intuition and your inner promptings about whether or not um, they need help. And if they can tell you no and your gut's like, mm, keep checking back on them, even if you, even if they say, oh no, that's okay, I'm good. If your gut is like wrestling with, mm, there's something wrong here, trust that. Like I said, my intuition has literally helped me save lives. Of course, I'm especially attuned to this in people because of my ex personal experience, right? So I just want to give that, run that flag up the pole too, that don't disregard your own intuition when it comes to others. And if you need help, help is available. I'm going to read that number for the suicide hotline again. It's 1-800-273-8255. One eight hundred two seven three talk T A L K is the number for a twenty four hour a day seven days a week professional hotline that's absolutely free. You can call at any time. So I'm gonna end right there. Be well, peace. <laughs>